Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 227, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with the co-creator of Rogue, Mr. Glenn Wickman. A lot of great stuff in this episode. We talk about uh, Glenn's struggles trying to support a family on a game developer salary, the difference between programming and engineering, what it's like to work at Zynga, and much, much more. I've also incorporated uh, all the Rogue likes you guys submitted, along with the uh, credits for the people who recommended them. So if you ever been interested in roguelikes, you'll definitely like this episode. Anyway, we've got a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Glenn Wickman. All right, so I saw an, an older interview where you were talking, sort of like you were a while ago, about how the uh, back in the 80s, just a small team, maybe even just one guy, could make a, a commercially viable game. Uh, nowadays, though, it takes hundreds of people to create a game, and this is uh, what you said here, the quote, there's no room for the vision of a single individual. I was just wondering, do you think that's changing now again with all the, you know, the Kickstarter stuff and those tools like Unity, all these sort of uh, do-it-yourself game creation kits, or do you still think it's pretty much uh, uh, no room? Um, well, I think there was a point when, when the iPhone first came out where there was another window where you know one person could sit down and put together uh, an app, um, you know there's uh, there's a game I, iPhone game called Drop Seven that I play practically every day, and that certainly I don't know how many people were involved in putting that together, but it certainly is you know of a scale where a single person could do it. There's uh, you know there's not that much to it, um, but that window may be closed again. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's always, you know, individuals can always create games, but whether or not they can create something commercially viable uh, in this environment, I don't know. I think anybody who's got enough vision and has enough of whatever it takes to make that vision become a reality can still do it. You just need to, you know, get uh, somewhere between a dozen and a hundred people uh, to uh, be involved in bringing your vision to reality, and then you've got to get somebody with enough money to put <laughs> to fund all of that. So, you know, sometimes I wonder if there's sort of a some sort of proportional uh, relationship between uh, the size of the teams and the originality of the games that we get. You know, it seems like the larger and larger the teams have to be, the more sequels and you know, me too sorts of clones that we get. Do you see any kind of correlation there too? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that you're, you're always going to find exceptions. Um, but, uh, um, I, I think that's true in general that if you, when you're risking a lot of money, right, you, uh, unless you find yourself with it, you know, <laughs> Uh, if you can somehow self-finance and, and you don't care whether it succeeds or not, you know you can survive if it doesn't. Um, I think the, the pressure against doing something original is, is pretty high. Um, but again, you know, things do come out of the blue every now and then. Um, I think Angry Birds was very original. Um, and, you know, so innovation still happens. Brand new things still happen. All right, so another quotation I found uh, that I thought was pretty interesting. I don't remember when this, I should have written this down. I didn't write down the, the date of this. But you said, I am surprised that people still create software to be downloaded and installed. You know, all software should be online. I'm just kind of wondering why you, why you think that. and You don't see any, any problems with it? I, I, that is something that l long before it was a reality, I was wishing for it. Um, you know, uh, during my period of time outside of the games business, you know, I worked on uh, Quicken and, you know, we, we would release once a year. And if there was a bug that you found after it was released, you had to hope that everybody who had installed it had registered and then 
send all of them letters telling them that they needed to download a patch and get on a BBS. And I thought, this is, this is crazy. You know, you should just, when you start a game or, or any piece of software, you should always be using the latest and greatest version of it. Um, so yeah, I, I am dismayed that as we have moved into the app store and Google play that, uh, to me, it feels like a big step backwards uh, into, you know, having to support dozens of versions of your software because nobody has to upgrade. Um, and uh, so, you know, people have uh, software that you, you know that, <laughs> that they could have something better. So, yeah, I, I'm still a big believer in that. And I, I'm sure that there are people who are going to argue the other side of that. But um, I think uh, that, that uh, you know, I, right now the, the software that I work on um, is, is Words with Friends, uh, the Facebook client. And, you know, we can put new versions out there at a moment's notice and everybody who's playing is playing the newest version. So I think that's great. Yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us how you ended up at Zynga. Um, so uh, as, I, as has been true of many people who have wanted to do games for a living, uh, you find yourself sometimes out of options and uh, doing other kinds of software. Although to me, I, I decided that it was all games. So I, I did the personal finance game, which was called Quicken and, and the customer relationship management game, which was called upshot.com. Um, so uh, I, was, uh, I was working at a startup. I, I lived in, uh, I moved to Tucson, Arizona for about 10 years and, but I was telecommuting the whole time. So I was working for a company in, in California, and it was a four-person startup uh, that never quite got off the ground. So we spent several years working on the concept um, and uh, at some point had to put ourselves up for sale. And um, one of the companies that we shopped to was Zynga. Um, and... Um, I, I knew people who worked here, so I already was, you know, had some interest in what they were doing. I was, was and am um, a big believer in social games, in games as a means to deepen and broaden uh, people's connections with each other. So, um, and I was excited about this uh, some of the aspects of cooperative games. So Farmville, you know, and, and things like that where, okay, we're, we're all working together to make the best thing that we can. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, in the process of us selling this company, we, we went around to the companies that were thinking of buying us and they interviewed each of us. Uh, and at my interview here, uh, the, they were talking about um, a uh, a social network for gamers, and I thought, "Wow, if that comes out, and I knew that I could have been on the team that made it, and I passed that up, uh, I would be kicking myself for the rest of my life." So it's like, where do I sign? So the company I was at ended up being sold to a different company, but I said, "I want to work here," and. They hired me, um, so that was three years ago, and uh, um, that proje the project I came here to be on kind of went through a few different iterations and changes in vision and stuff like that as, as happens in this business, um, and uh, so I'm not on that project now, but uh, I'm working on Words with Friends, so... Yeah, I think that's awesome. I mean, everybody knows that game. You must, you know, be riding the bus sometimes and see somebody playing that and say, "Hey, <laughs> I did that." Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting. It's not my game, and you know, at any given time, I've got a good half dozen ideas for games uh, in my head, and uh, I would still love it if, at some point, you know, at Zynga, I get to do one of my own games, but. Um, 
but this is a really nice game. I, I enjoy playing it. Um, I enjoyed, you know, it was originally developed by a company called New Toy that Zynga acquired. So I was playing it before it was even part of Zynga and before I was part of Zynga. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to be working on it. So you like working at Zynga? I hope they recognize, you know, your legacy of Rogue and everything. <laughs> you know, what, what's, uh, are they sort of in awe of you as you walking around the hallways there? As a company, I, I don't think <laughs> necessarily, no. I mean, there's, you know, there are a lot of uh, um, legendary people who are or have been involved with Zynga uh, over the years. You know, it's, it's a, uh, um, it's still a small valley and there's a lot of people here who are at electronic arts or, um, you know, other places like that. So I'm far from the biggest name in games here. Um, but again, especially with some of the people who are just out of college, that was again, one of the things that, that kind of surprised me that I, I had thought I'd been completely forgotten about. And then, Occasionally, you know, especially if somebody came from a game design program and then, oh, Rogue, you're that guy. So that, that does happen every now and then. Uh, Let's say a couple last questions here. Uh, one, I, I was looking at the Moby Games entry for you, and they mentioned a couple of other games they just say you contributed to. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what these kind of contributions were. Uh, but Life and Death and Hunt for Red October. Yeah, um, so, so I, those were both at Software Toolworks, which is the company that did Mavis Beacon. Um, and in both of those cases, I just kind of helped out with the Mac port. Um, with Hunt for Red October, well, what, what happened, I, so I was working at Software Toolworks, and, I, and this was uh, in Sherman Oaks, California. So I moved down to L.A. I was living in North Hollywood. And I was about a mile from Disney Studios, um, and I had, so this is going to be a long story, but I, I think it's interesting. So um, I had, uh, I worked at Disneyland when I was uh, 19, so I kind of, you know, had a, a, a love for things Disney, and I had this concept for um, Disneyland games, so it would basically be a, a, a suite of computer games uh, inspired by the rise at Disneyland. And so I took that to my bosses at Software Toolworks and I said, you know, here's my idea, what do you guys think? And uh, they said, well, it sounds like a good idea, but it's, it's not for us. And I said, well, can I just, can I have it then? Um, so uh, for not the first time in my life, I, uh, took an idea and ran with it and went off and started my own company um, and went to Disney, you know, and, and actually kind of got to the point where I uh, was, you know, having meetings with people at Disney about and had this whole 17 page proposal for Disneyland games that was promising. So, um, so I quit working at software tool works, but I still needed money. And so uh, I was just doing contract work for them. Um, so in both of those cases, Hunt for Red October and Life and Death, um, I helped with the Mac ports of those. Uh, by helped with it, basically both of them had been ported to the Mac very badly by PC programmers and who, who didn't really understand how to make Mac software. Um, and so I kind of went in and, and, and rewrote those. Um, the one other thing that I did for Life and Death was actually there's a, a picture on the cover of the box, which is four surgeons staring down at, at the person being operated on, right? Sort of from the patient's point of view, looking up. And so uh, I'm one of those surgeons. So I, I'm, I'm on the box cover there. Okay, so the one thing I always like to ask of folks is, uh, you know, what, what's your advice for aspiring uh, game designers, programmers, people like that. They, maybe they don't even really know exactly what they want to do, but they know they want to work in the games industry. And let's say they're maybe in high school or just starting out in college. What's your advice to get them there? 
That is a good question. I think there's a lot of different ways to get there. Um, you know, it, it's it's so different from when I was starting out. Um, one of the things that's uh, been tough for me is, uh, again, when I started out, there wasn't necessarily a difference between the game designer and the programmer. Um, and I happen to have both skill sets. They, they are two different skill sets, and you can certainly have one but not the other. Um, and I, I tried to straddle those things for as long as I could and ended up landing more on the engineering side. You know, that's, that's my job. I'm an, I'm an engineer. I'm not here as a game designer. Uh, that's just sort of a bonus is that I've got those skills. Um, so I would think, uh, I would surmise in this day and age, you know, figure out what you want to do. There are so many different ways you can be involved in the industry now. Uh, so, uh, but I think it's really hard to try to be a jack of all trades kind of the way that I came in. Um, so I would say pick what you want to do. Um, I think it's, it seems more important now to, you know, to go to college and get a degree. I don't think that's absolutely necessary. I, I certainly managed without it. Um, but I think that even if you don't get a degree, I think uh, being in a college environment is great. You've got a lot of chance to just really do some blue sky exploring and things that you're never going to have an opportunity to do once you've got a job, you know, and have to produce stuff all the time. Um, and I think, you know, read some of these books, watch, watch some more Matt chats and realize this is a really, really crazy industry and everybody's got stories of their companies disappearing out from under them and, you know, uh, stories of, of massive amounts of money suddenly pouring in, but then all of it being gone again a couple of years later. Um, so, you know, think about, do you really want to be on a wild ride? Because this really is a wild ride. And for me, I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I've enjoyed the ride the whole time. I, you know, when I was raising my kids, I kind of, again, stepped out of the games industry uh, and, uh, and worked on things that had a little bit more stability, like personal finance and customer relations software and stuff like that. But uh I am so glad to be back in doing games uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's just incredibly rewarding to know that you are creating things that are making people happy. Oh, well, you mentioned you're an engineer. I was wondering if you could you know, explain what that entails exactly. Um, well, I think, again, it's going to be very different at different companies. So in terms of what I do, I'm a... Uh, a lead engineer working on web software. So I am writing code in, in uh, JavaScript mostly. Um, <clears throat> and uh, basically involves working hand in hand with game designers, graphic designers, and product managers who are responsible for the look and the feel and uh, the success of a feature. Uh, the manager response. How's the engineers different than the programmers? No, it's it's just a cooler word than programmer. Programmer just sounds uh, to me like it's uh, um, not a creative sort of position. And being an engineer is extremely creative. Um, so it's, you know, it's like writing poetry, uh, writing beautiful code that's uh, efficient and easy to understand and easy for other people to use um, is a great skill. Um, so, you know, the engineers, you know, what I remind my team is uh, the, de the designers can design, the product managers can come up with uh, how they want it to work. But we're the only ones who can actually make it happen. You know, we're the ones who can turn ideas into reality. So that's what an engineer does. That's an awesome description. Uh, well, I guess we're kind of, uh, you know, I've exhausted all my questions. I, 
a couple silly things, I guess. I'm kind of wondering how long you've had the, the long hair. Has that always been part of your, your look? Um, off and on. It's, uh, I, every now and then I get tired of it and cut it short. And then I think, oh, why did I do that? Now it's going to take me years to get it back long again. So um, what I've currently got here represents uh, about 18 months since my last haircut. Uh, but, yeah, if you look at uh, pictures of me on Facebook, you'll see that, that it's, it's long sometimes and it's short sometimes. But it was, it was long when I was in college. Um, you ever play in a band? You look kind of like you'd be going on a guitar, maybe. Or... I am great playing bass in rock band. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't have actual musical talent. Um, my, my wife is a musician, and my kids inherited the musical talent from there. And I uh, um, used to, like, play guitar at... Uh, like at summer camp and stuff like that. So I can bang out a few chords, but I don't have actual musical talent. Um, so no, I just, I can look like a rock star, but not be one. Well, thanks a lot, Glenn, for taking the time out of your day to do this interview. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover or think we should cover that we haven't mentioned? Um, no, I think uh, uh, the, you know, I really appreciate uh, being interviewed, uh, being remembered. I, I, you know, I've looked at a lot of your uh, or a few of your other interviews and thinking, oh, wow, these, you know, these are sort of big people in the games industry. And I was uh, sort of spent time on the edges of it and time out of it and time in it. And, uh, um, and then I thought, well, you know what, that's actually a pretty typical career path. So it's probably good to have you know, that, uh, that perspective of, uh, it's really hard to, uh, especially if you want to like raise a family and have, you know, actual responsibilities, which I don't necessarily recommend if you haven't made that decision yet. Um, it's really hard to have a career where you stay in this industry the whole time. And some people have managed it and some people haven't. Um, but I think that that's okay. You know, do it for a while, maybe go on to other things or maybe, you know, go in and out of it like I did. And you can still have a, a very happy career. I've heard a lot of stories like the EA spouse. I don't know if you're familiar with that story. You think it's just too difficult to have a, a family and do games? Um, well, you know, I, I've, I've, got only my own experience. Um, I tried to, uh, you know, and ended up just sort of, again, running out of options. I was, uh, but I don't know that I made all of the best decisions either. Uh, you know, I really tried to do this, this Disneyland games thing and, and ended up, uh, you know, with a wife and a young child and completely broke and, uh, you know, and then said, well, I, you know, I know I can get a job as an engineer and, and, you know, at a stable company and make good money and, you know, it just won't be games. Um, so I'm sure there are people who have been in the games business the whole time and no other business and have been, have been very successful at it. So, uh, I think it can be done. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, it's hard though. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week and this is going to be a really epic moment. This will be the fifth year anniversary Match Hat special. Can you believe it? Five years. Uh, I would like to hear your suggestions and the things you'd like to see on that episode. If you have those ideas, please share them with me here on YouTube or Matt Chat or wherever you want. I'm happy to entertain those. And as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys, for keeping this show on the air. I've uh, set up that Patreon site. If you haven't heard about that yet, uh, yet go check it out. Uh, 
you guys have just been utterly fantastic. I'm amazed at the number of people who have stepped up to support the show, keep it on the air, uh, keep these uh, interviews and retrospectives coming. So uh, just thank you uh, so much for that, guys. It really makes a huge difference. Now, what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, keeping with my rogue theme, kind of had a little hiccup there, but we're back with the rogues. Uh, this is the double rogue... Uh, double Dead Guy L. Oh, excuse me. So, Double Rogue, Double Dead Guy L. Uh, I really like the regular Dead Guy L. Never tried this double one before. So, really looking forward to that. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Barley Farm, Dare and Risk Malts, uh, Crystal Cascade, and Rogue Micro Hop Yard. <laughs> it was, it's amazing the amount of technical information you get on these bottles nowadays. I guess a lot of you guys are probably doing the, the brewing uh, yourself. Actually, would uh, love to sample some of your brews if you're into that. Uh, Nine percent alcohol by volume, so it's on up there. Not too bad though. Uh, Nineteen point eight Plato, seventy-two IBU, uh, twenty-six degrees Lovey Bond. <laughs> are they just making this stuff up? Uh, these guys are out of Newport, Oregon. Uh, anyway, very well-respected brewery. Anyway, let's try this double dead guy ale. See what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this double dead guy ale here in this rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it. It's a really, really nice aroma on this. You can uh, smell that sort of bourbon-like uh, quality to it, sort of a molasses-like uh, aroma. A bit of uh, raisins and currants in there. Uh, it just smells really appetizing. Uh, I'm going to give a toast this week. I've got two people to toast who have really stepped up to the uh, Patreon bandwagon. Uh, Scott Cooper, who actually contributed at the sponsorship level, so definitely be toasting to you, Scott. And also to Thomas Sturm, who stepped up at the $25 level <laughs> right next to uh, Brian Fargo. So uh, really uh, epic, you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, so here's to you. Uh, explosive flavor on this one. It's very, uh, very crisp, uh, very refreshing actually. It's sort of a lot of a chocolatey taste, a little bit of a peanut butter like quality to it, a little bit of coffee. Uh, the hops are just right. Um, really no bitterness to this at all. Let me try it again. I fart in your general direction. It's a, uh, it's very sweet actually. Um, you get that, uh, like I said, sort of the chocolatey, a little bit of a a coffee quality, maybe a little bit of caramel. There, there's the word I'm looking for. Sort of a caramel-like uh, quality to this. It's a very good, very smooth. Uh, I mean, what can you say? It's a very good ale. Try it one more time. Fellas, smoke me a kippa. I'll be back for breakfast. <sighs> yeah, just a just an all-around a really delicious uh, selection here. Uh, the Double Dead Guy Ale. I'm definitely going to go a full uh, five out of five drinking horns on this one. Uh, no question about it. Really great stuff. If you happen upon one of these, go ahead and try it. I don't think you'll be disappointed at all. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, I was looking for quotations about rogues, and I found a really good one uh, from one of my favorite authors uh, of Three Musketeers, Alexander Dumas. It goes something like this. I prefer rogues to imbeciles because they sometimes take a rest. See you guys next week. But I'm a competitive man, Crichton. Always have been. That's what makes me what I am. We're all perfectly well aware of what you are, sir.